as many people as you can. Come on, move around. We have some special guests sitting in the middle section. I want you to greet them very warmly.
Just to make sure we don't miss anybody out, I want you to turn to one person. Just turn to one person. Just one person. And I, you know what I'm going to tell you to say to them. You're going to say to them, if I were not here, you would be the best looking person in church today. But since I'm here, Sister Devil Scott is coming to I'm so sorry, Sister Devilly McHugh is coming to give us our official welcome and to tell us what's on the agenda here at Pentab in the next few days. Let's welcome Sister McHugh. Praise the Lord, everybody. If you are happy and you know it, say amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I'm still Scott, eh? <laughs> Sometimes I even forget the McHugh. Amen, praise God. It's a wonderful time in the house of God. I feel good. How are you feeling this morning? Praise God, praise God, praise God. Some of you are not telling the truth. All right, let me welcome everyone to the house of God this morning. If you are a guest of ours, please stand. This is our way of acknowledging your presence. Please stand up wherever you are. Praise God. Wow, absolutely wonderful. It is my delight to welcome you to Pentecostal Tabernacle, and we trust that you will come again. I know you were greeted earlier by our, visit, our members, but please, those who are close by, just reach across again and just welcome all our visitors. Praise God, praise God. Absolutely wonderful. I just want to acknowledge the general management seminar class of uh, 2017. And they are from the College of Business at the University of Technology. Can we put our hands together for them? <laughs> I believe today marks the beginning of the, the um, celebration of excellence. I like that. Praise God. One more time. Put your hands together for them. Praise God. You may be seated. I trust that you are feeling at home already. You might see some of us clapping, dancing, and singing. I tell you, we are just excited about Jesus. So don't be shocked. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Those who are viewing us live from all over the world, I just want to welcome you to the service as well. Praise God. I was informed that there are some people from Southside. Are you here? You're worshiping with us this morning. Where are you? Just wave your hands. That's right. <laughs> Praise God. When were we um, at Southside? Was it last Sunday? I tell you, I tell you, it was fabulous. Those who went shout hallelujah. 
It's always good to give back and also to share the experience. Amen. With our community members. Praise God. Brian Berger, I was informed that you're here. Welcome back, Brian Berger. Where are you? Oh, he's on the balcony. <laughs> praise God, praise God. And guess who is here? Welcome back, Sister Vivian Ruddock. <laughs> you were certainly missed. I will not tell you what her fifth. I was informed that the mayor has returned. Praise God, praise God. I tell you, the choir members are something else. Let me also acknowledge the presence of Pastor Siblis um, and Sister, yes, Pastor and Sister Siblis. Pastor Siblis is a pastor of Ebenezer United Pentecostal Church in Bronx, New York. Pastor Siblis, <laughs> praise God. Welcome, sir. And I hope you are feeling at home. Praise God, praise God. I want to recognize Elfreda Edwards from Boston, Nora, Norma Joseph, John J Dage. John Dage is here, Brother John. Where is he? Praise God, welcome. <laughs> welcome back. All right, Anna K. Is this Kushni? You're here, Anna K. Kushni. T Tony K. Burton, Judith Richards, and Sister Sarah Anderson Murphy. Where are you? All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. Tell your neighbor, please listen to the following announcement. All right, here goes. So this evening at 6.45 is our evening service. Praise God. Amen. On Tuesday at 12 noon, only for two hours, our golden ages per time in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. Or, yes, 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 I hear your shouting. At 6 p.m., our annual saints um, financial meeting. And please, you're being asked to attend, all of us. On Wednesday, that's the 15th of March, 6.30 a.m. morning, manner. At 11.30 a.m. prayer and fasting service. At 6.30 p.m. prayer and Bible study. Tell your neighbor, prayer and Bible study. Good. Uh, the 16th at 6 p.m., that's on Tuesday, a special leadership and ministers meeting. All church board members, ministry directors, and UPCJ licensed ministers are asked to attend this meeting on the first floor north of the, the admin building. Members are asked to support Pentab Nannyville's Youth Week service. That's this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. On Friday at 7, members are asked to support the Youth Week service at Pentab Hellshire 3A Orchid Way. Saturday at 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Zone 4 prayer meeting at Faith Basic School, 2 Duncan's Road of Trelawney East Waterford. At 10 a.m., the funeral service for Brother Howard Hilton. And it will be held right here at Pentecostal Tabernacle. That's this Saturday at 10 a.m. At 1 p.m., the following persons are asked to attend a meeting in the conference room. Brother Errol Robinson, Sisters Michelle Grant, Julian Beckford, Rosalie Sawyers, and Lorna Sr., on Sunday at 6 a.m., rightly dividing the word on RJR Fame FM at 7 a.m. per time in the sanctuary at 8 a.m. pre-session, 8.30 Sunday school, 10.15 a.m. We will be having a special missions service and a children's church. At 1 p.m. on Sunday, the funeral service for the daughter of Sister Pauline Ennis, and it will be held at Faith Christian Missionary, 45 and a half, Smith Lane. And uh, we will be having a service next week, Sunday evening. And that begins at 6.45 p.m. Praise God. And our pastor is very excited about that. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. And have an extraordinary week in Jesus. Praise God.
Let us stand for the reading of the Bible. Matthew 5. If you can, if you have your Bibles, please find it. Matthew 5. Is it on the screen? Matthew 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. But I believe some theologians said it's not possible for this woman to have wept so much, to produce so much tears, to wash Jesus' feet. They said maybe at times at nights when she remembered the demons that used to plague her and she's now delivered, should cry and catch the tears in a vial. She remember her work in prostitution. Maybe she just catch those tears and say, anywhere me buck him, he might go get it. I don't know about you, but worship should be anywhere you are. God gon' get it. Oh, glory be to Jesus. You don't have to wait to come to church to give it. You can give it at your workplace. That's where you should give it. And let your co-workers know you worship the true and living God. We now return to your regular programming. Hallelujah. Just, just remain standing, please. Uh, ushers, would you come? We're going to receive our tithes and our offerings at this time. Uh, Sister Plummer is here with us, and uh, we didn't make mention of that. Sister Plummer, would you just wave your hands where you are? Amen. Let's clap our hands for Sister Plummer. Wonderful. And Brother Lieber Drisdale is here. Yes. Uh, Brother Drisdale. Brother Drisdale, you probably have to stand on the bench. Just wave your hand where you are. Let's clap our hands for Brother Drisdale. Wonderful to have you, sir. I'm just... There's something in the back of my mind telling me I'm missing somebody. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure who it is. But uh, Sister Jackson, we welcome Sister Jackson. Didn't we welcome you, Sister Jackson? Never welcomed you? It's a crying shame. It's good to have you, Lady Jackson, all the way from the Bahamas. Is that right? Let's clap our hands and welcome Sister. Amen. 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 Uh, brethren, we have another opportunity now to invest in the kingdom of God, and we want to appreciate the fact that 
our giving is a part of our worship. Is that right? Amen. And um, the Lord is not so much concerned about what we give. He's more concerned about how we give. And if you want to measure sacrifice, don't measure how much is put in the offering. Measure how much you have left after you have given. And there are persons here, and whenever we gather, there will always be persons who have a strong desire to give, but you just don't have anything to give. We don't want you to feel bad. Amen? You don't have to feel bad. But there is somebody beside you who you can get an offering from. I guarantee you, the person beside you is very wealthy. So you just ask them for... $2,000, start high, you might get one. Bow your heads, please. Lord, we give you thanks for today, for your goodness. We understand very clearly that we are here by your grace. We understand that we don't deserve to be here. We understand that if it had not been for Calvary, we couldn't even darken the door space. So we're not taking our presence here for granted. We don't want to take your blessings for granted. We never want to think that we did this by ourselves. Not unto us. But unto thy name, O Lord, give glory. As we come with our gifts, Lord, we ask you to help us to do so with cheerful hearts, thankful hearts. We will ever praise you and worship you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Just before we move... I published the bands of marriage between Roy Sylvester Lowe and Marie Anita Dunkley, both of the parish of St. Catherine. If anyone knows cause or just impediment, why these two persons may not be joined together in holy matrimony, ye ought to declare it or forever hereafter hold your peace. Our singers and musicians are leading us in worship as we come today. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord, everybody. Let's worship the Lord, everybody. If you know that God is fighting for you today, you have the victory in Jesus' name today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
mighty and just strong. Fight this battle for me. Help my unbelief so I can tell all my friends you have one of uh, the of the Lord this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Fight this battle for me, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Help my unbelief, Lord. Fight on my behalf, Jesus, this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Amen, amen, amen. I just wish we had enough time just to just go on worshiping. Praise God. Amen. Again, we are delighted to have the, the students and facilitators from the University of Technology, Jamaica. And in particular, the general management class of 2017. And at this time, I'm going to invite Dana Lee Walker to come and do the Bible reading.
Praise the Lord, everybody. The scripture reading this morning will be taken from Luke 13, verses 1 to 13. I'll be reading in your hearing. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans, because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or these, those eighteen upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of this vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, while cumbereth it the ground. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then shall you cut it down. And he was teaching in one of the synagogue on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman with a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called unto her and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was straight and glorified God. Here endeth a portion of God's holy word. Thanks be to God.
protector, protector, provider, 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 we make up. Lord have mercy. Praise God, praise God. Can we just shout the name of Jesus? Can we just shout the name of Jesus? Can we just shout the name of Jesus? Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Everything that you want him to be this morning, he can be just that. Hallelujah. I found him to be a friend. Ah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. What an awesome God. Anybody just, you just want to lift your hands. You, you just want to say, thank you, Jesus. You just want to worship him in your special way right now. Hallelujah. Maybe you have not opened your mouth since morning, since you came through the door. Maybe now is a good time just to say something to Jesus. Hallelujah. Ah, Lord Jesus, you're so wonderful. Praise God, praise God. We can feel your presence, Lord, in this atmosphere. My God, my God, my God. Praise God. At this time, we're going to have an address um, by the president. And um, her name is Yolanda Willis. And... My utmost apologies. His name is Yolando with Lewis. And following that, we'll have a prayer. And this will be done by Brother Nathan Thomas. God bless you. Good morning. So... I went to an all-boys school, so, you know, the variations in my name, I'm accustomed to. No, blue and white. <laughs> True blue. <laughs> a special greeting to Pastor Bartlett and the saints of Pentab. Good morning, Pentab. My name is Yolando Lewis. I'm the president of the general management class of the University of Technology from School of Business. I'd like to take this opportunity to say a special good morning to a few of our leaders. Um, Mrs. Leibert, Ms. Hastings, Mrs. Richards, good morning. Also, my vice presidents, my first vice president, Miss Wilson, the lead singer of our choir. And Mr. Robinson, my second VP. Uh, he was in the back with me. <laughs> so I must acknowledge one of our very own and yours, Mr. Borrell. And finally, it's my honor to introduce my colleagues, a group of final year students who've been put to the task of doing some very different things this year. We've dubbed ourselves Geminar. Geminar, good morning. So today, as you were told, marks the commencement of the University of Technology's Week of Excellence. The Week of Excellence is a celebration of the accomplishments of both the students as well as the university. It is a platform used to showcase some of the, the remarkable talents and creative works that comes from the university. In our case, Geminar, we have been preparing for a conference that we'll be hosting. This will be held at the Jamaica Conference Center on March 21st to 22nd. First, we'd like to say thank you very much um, for having us here today. 
We sincerely really appreciate you accommodating us. We've definitely been feeling your, um, your accommodation. So thank you so very much. But we're here to ask you for something. We would like to ask your blessing via prayer for us to have a successful conference. It's quite critical for us to have a successful conference. And as such, we're asking Pentab to pray for us as we embark on something we've, none of us have ever done before. And we'd just like to have a very, very, very good conference, a splendid conference. So, Mr. Borrell advised us that recently you guys took steps to go green at this church in that you've um, installed some solar panels. Well done. I believe in that. I support that completely. Um, we know that it's a costly venture. And as such, you know, we're sure you'll see the returns on it. It's, it's, it's actually something that will be beneficial to you very, very soon. So we at Geminar, we actually believe and we are actually very concerned about the environment as well. As such, one of our sub-themes for our conference will be a presentation on managing, eco -friendly, managing an eco-friendly environment. <clears throat> So we have a thought that we share in common, right? Mm -hmm. So we've decided that we're going to make a small donation to Pentab um, Development Fund. Um, So it is intended to continue on your mission because we believe in what you believe in. All right? Thank you. <laughs> yes, let, let's do this right. Yes, let's do this right. You're most welcome, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everyone. that we gave it to the... <laughs> Got it. <laughs> well, the real thing. <laughs> the official one. Amen. Mr. President, Mr. President. I, I guess we can safely say that it has been delivered. don't want Brother Damon to be on in, under any pressure. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Mr. President, can I ask you just to lead your team to the front? We really want to pray for you and the members of your team, as well as uh, lecturers, facilitators. We really want to pray for you. I'm going to ask 
if you don't mind, some of our brothers and sisters from our assembly just to, to draw closer to the members of the Geminar team. And we really want to pray for their success. Amen. It's hard work, planning, long nights. And yes, resources are needed to carry it out. And we want to pray that all will, will go well. Some of our ladies, some of our gentlemen, just ask you just to come. Stand in front or if there is space in between to fit yourselves in. Amen. And I'm going to ask those of us who can't come up, I'm going to ask us just to stand just for a couple of minutes. And I want us just to stretch forth our hands to this altar area as we pray. Amen. 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 Let's all lift our voices and pray. Lord, indeed, you are good and your mercies are from everlasting to everlasting. Lord, we just want to thank you today, this day that you have made, God. Lord, we thank you for the members of the University of Technology, Lord, especially the gener general management group, Lord, who saw it fit in their planning, Lord, to place this part, hallelujah, in their plans, God, to be in your presence. Lord, we know it's not by chance, but you would orchestrate, Lord, such an event today in the minds of each and every person that they would agree to be in your presence, God. It tells us that they are asking for your divine intervention. And Lord Jesus, we don't want to take it for granted. Lord, we're asking you to show up for them today, Lord. Not tomorrow, not next week, but today, Lord Jesus. Per adventure, there is someone here, Lord, who needs a special touch from you right now, God. We're praying that your Holy Spirit will come down, Lord Jesus, and rest upon them, Lord. It doesn't matter who they are. Lord, it doesn't matter what they believe in. But God, there is a cry from the depths of the soul, from the depths of the heart for you, Lord Jesus. And we're praying that you would respond. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the gift that they have given to us, Lord Jesus, for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord Jesus, we pray that indeed you would bless them indeed. We pray for the seminar. We pray for those who have asked, Lord Jesus, those who have been contacted to participate in the conference, the speakers, Lord Jesus, the special team, Lord God, that will look after hospitality, who would put the notes together. Lord, we pray that indeed, Lord Jesus, you will watch over them and guide them, we pray. Lord, we tell you thanks this morning for all that you have done and for what you will continue to do in the lives of these individuals. We worship you. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's just lift our hands and say, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God. Hallelujah. You may return to your seat. We want to thank this group for choosing Pentecostal Tabernacle to host its service. And again, we wish you all the very best uh, with the planning and coordination of your conference to be held on March 21 at the Jamaica Conference Center. May the Lord bless and keep you all. Praise God. Can we just clap our hands for this group one more time? We also want to thank you for your gift. 
your contribution as well towards our building fund. At this time, we'll be having the ministering of the choir from Pentecostal Tabernacle. Praise God.
Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, all we have is Jesus. He's all we have. You know it, this church, we have no superstars, no big names. No headliners, no showstoppers. All we have is Jesus. That's all we have. If we're going to be healed, Jesus has to heal us. If we're going to be delivered, Jesus has to do it. If provision is going to come, Jesus has to provide. Psalm said, my expectation is of you. Let's worship him some more. Anybody in here, you know the Lord is a healer? Listen now. I'm not asking you about what you think. Anybody in here, you know that the Lord is a healer. How many know he's a deliverer? How many know he's a provider? question is, how many know him as Lord? He can do all those things for us without being our Lord. Amen. 
Amen. Is he your Lord? You may be seated for a little while. Uh, your service this evening, right? Let's try that again. Your service this evening, right? Uh, we'd like for everyone who is here to come back. Having a very special meeting this evening at 6.45. And next Sunday morning, we're going to be having a very special service. We're going to be just looking at what we're doing in terms of our evangelism program. And I want to share with you some plans that we have and um, just give you some information that I believe many of you might not know. And so we would like for you to come next Sunday and um, just begin to pray from now about what the Lord would want for you to do. Amen. I believe we need to appoint some full-time home missionaries. I believe we need to do that. I think our missions giving has to include Jamaica. And there are some inner city communities very close to Pentecostal Tabernacle that we would like to put some people in there full-time just every day working. And um, you know, folks, I believe we're going to do it. I really believe we're going to do it. We're going to do the will of the Lord in our brethren. We're going to do the will of the Lord. So I'd like for you to think about what your responsibility will be. I, I really want to say a great big thank you to our graduating class, uh, first of all, for choosing to come to worship at Pentecostal Tabernacle, um, Kingston and St. Andrew probably have thousands of churches, well, hundreds for sure, and um, the fact that they have chosen Pentecostal Tabernacle uh, means a lot to us. We really appreciate that. And we appreciate your gift so very much. Thank you for thinking about us. It, it's really very special. And <laughs> we, 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 we don't take it for granted. And we know some of you uh, are connected with churches. And so you've had to kind of dislocate today. And we understand that that is not easy to do. So we're very grateful to all of you for uh, students, teachers, administrators. We're very grateful to you. Amen. We're going to look briefly at the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. And we'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Luke 14, 25 to 33. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, well, let me ask you, if a large crowd was following you, what would you turn around and say to them? Huh? Wanna follow me for? Jesus turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. 
You notice Jesus' ministry was so different from the ministry of present-day evangelists. You know, we tend to play upon people's emotions. And we make promises to them that we can't keep just so that we can get somebody to be converted. So we'll say, you know, if you want a good husband, come to Jesus. And some have come, and it's been 40 years. But here's Jesus saying, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. Then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's a person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. And we do have buildings like that in our country. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. How many still want to be disciples? This isn't so attractive. And I'm believing that all of us need to move away from just trying to tickle people's fancy and play upon their emotions and um, just tell them like it is. It's not easy to be a Christian. And Jesus never said it would be. And he never said that when you became a Christian, all your problems would be solved right away. Because he knew that sometimes when you come, problems are created. The call of Jesus Christ to men and women is a call to discipleship. Understand that, brethren? It's a call to discipleship is the true calling and function of the church. Nothing more is required and nothing less is expected. Discipleship. Discipleship, the true calling. And Jesus calls us to be disciples. He doesn't call us to have a good time on Sunday morning calls us to be disciples and we must function as disciples we can't function as people who come on sunday and then on monday we're what are we jamaica is tired about hearing of people who are supposed to be christians discipleship everybody say discipleship in light of the fact that Jesus Christ demands discipleship, then discipleship should be the goal of the church. We should not stop short of discipleship. I'm not here just to speak in tongues and have a good time. I'm here to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. If all salvation can give me is a good feeling, I've told the Lord. And you might say, that's not a good way to talk to, talk to Jesus. But, but I've told him. I've said, Lord, if all you can give me is a shout and a dance and some tongues, keep it. Because I had all of that before I came to this church. 
What I wanted when I came was a change of life. Messed up, sick life. I wanted to change. Now, in the scripture that we read, and I, I'm deliberately trying to stay calm. For more reasons than one. It's more healthy to stay calm. In the, in the text that we read, Jesus outlined some conditions for discipleship that we will look at. But based on the conditions, what we find is that not every individual who calls himself or herself a Christian is really a disciple. If you should place our lives alongside the lifestyle of Jesus and the lifestyle that he outlined for his disciples, many of us would come up short. Maybe all of us, including me. In our day, one may be regarded as a Christian just because you go to a church. But in Jesus' day, to be a disciple called for extremely high levels of commitment. And, 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 and on one occasion, Peter said to him, we have left all to follow you. That's what was required. We have left all. Jesus calls for extremely high levels of commitment from those who want to follow him. He does not lower the bar for anybody. Following him is not a walk in the park. Nowhere do we see him in his earthly ministry complying with easy levels of commitment. In fact, sometimes he almost appears to be harsh. He said to one man, come and follow me. And the man said, allow me to bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. If you talk about that in the modern church world, people get upset. You're going to have to get upset with me today. A call to follow Jesus always involves radical changes in one's life. Radical changes. Radical meaning fundamental from the root. See, folks, when we come to God, the initial salvation experience is really an initial experience. That's where it begins. That's not where it ends. And Jesus, can I say this to us? The carnal nature that is inside of us. We think that only evil things are stored there. But we think what Jesus wants to work on is our bad ways. Jesus wants to totally Render inoperable the Adamic nature. He wants to bring about a whole new man. He's not interested in your good ways. Because if your good ways could help you, he wouldn't have to save you. I don't want to have to say what our righteousnesses are. I know you know filthy rags, but I don't want to have to explain it. Not today. Radical changes. And, and, and people need to know that up front, our gospel message must include an honest declaration. Count the cost. See, folks, unlike us, the mega church thing doesn't impress Jesus. What impresses Jesus is mega commitment. And if he has 10, that will give him mega commitment. 
is more interested than that than 10,000 that will give little commitment. Jesus, listen now, he's surrounded by a throng. He's walking and a multitude follows him. They're attentive to his every word. They're fascinated by him. He's a novelty. He's new, he's exciting, he's different. They have never seen anybody like this. Whole Jewish nation is longing for a leader like this. They believe he's the one who will deliver them from Roman servitude. All he needed to do was to, at one point in his ministry, at this point, if he had given a direction for them to rebel, Rome would have had a rebellion on their hands. What did he do? Did he flatter them? Did he promise them wives and husbands and houses and cars and jets and bling as we do? Not well, not me and, and not us. Did he perform some spectacular miracle to win their allegiance? In fact, it seemed that he was intent to alienate their interests. He stated in the strongest possible manner the very exacting conditions of discipleship. His method is exactly the opposite as the ones that are adopted by many preachers today. Instead of majoring on the benefits and the blessings and the perks that come with a relationship with him, he talked about suffering and hardships and, and, and sacrifice. Nobody preaches like that. No evangelist preaches like that. You never go to a tent crusade and hear anybody saying, it's going to be difficult. You're going to have to take up your cross. No, we just interest them with sweet part. And so everybody comes expecting sweet. And when sour comes, we are all unprepared. He placed the cost of being his disciple very high. Jesus never concealed the agony of the cross. From day one, Spoke about it more and more as time went by. But from day one, they knew this wasn't a walk in the park. No, a man came running up to him and said, I will follow you wherever you go. Big talk. Sounds good. I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, all right. I'm happy to hear that. I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. Many places we go will be rejected. You'll probably end up being killed for my name's sake. You still want to be my disciple? We never read anything more about that man. Boxes of holes. The birds of the air have their nests. I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight. Uh-oh. All right. Let me find another teacher to disciple myself to. I need a comfortable rest at night. Are you still there? What is involved in this matter of discipleship? At least three things that are mentioned in the scripture that we read. Number one, a love that is preeminent. A love that is preeminent. Number two, a willingness to take up the cross. A willingness to take up the cross. And number three, a surrender that is unreserved. 
we'll briefly look at these three and then we'll go home. A love that is preeminent. First condition of discipleship is a love for Jesus that is without equal. Jesus does not want any rivals. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, full stop. Not Christ and career, not Christ and family, not Christ and friends, not Christ and ministry, not Christ and title. For me to live is Christ, full stop. Anything else is not major. Christ, if I can't live for Christ, Nothing else makes sense. He's not demeaning my career or my family life or my friends. What he's saying is, if Jesus is not in the mix, it doesn't make any sense. I, I believe my children know it. I would prefer for them to go to heaven illiterate than to go to hell with a doctorate. But you don't have to trade. You can go to heaven with a doctorate and you can go to hell illiterate. Jesus first. Jesus second. Jesus third. He's the center of my joy. All that's good and all that's good, all that's good and perfect come from you. You are the heart of my contentment. Hope for all I do. See, folks, we need to listen to the songs we sing. Love that is preeminent. In verse 26 of Luke chapter 14. We read it. If you want to be my disciple, my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, so he's not leaving it up for us to speculate. Father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and the hardest one of all, your own self. Otherwise, you what? And not. And not. It's not a possibility. You cannot. You could be Pastor Bartlett's disciple, but not mine. You probably could be Pastor Bartlett's disciple, but not mine. I must be first. Don't tell me about your wife. When I call you, don't tell me about your husband. I'm not interested. I must be number one. Yes. Yes. Folks, that's what the book says. Yes. I'm reading from the book. Yes. Jesus said it. Those are the conditions of discipleship. That's number one. Preeminent love. The word hate has caused serious misunderstanding. Meaning of the word as it is used here by our Lord really means, see, Jesus couldn't be telling us at one point to love and to honor our father and mother and then telling us to hate them. It's a word of comparison. He's saying in comparison with the love that you have for me, your love for your family must look like hate. He's not saying hate your family. He's saying love me. Everybody must see that you love me best of all. Matthew chapter 10 verse 37 
kind of makes it a little more easy to understand. It says, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. So tell me now, who or what do we love more than Jesus? Christians, come on apostolics. Let's talk about it. Who do I love more than Jesus? What do I love more than Jesus? What is preventing me from giving all to Jesus? He's so serious about it, God is, that he'll tell Abraham, who's been faithful to him for years, take now thy son. He, and, and God was intentionally cruel. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. So I thought he had a son named Ishmael. But Ishmael wasn't God's business. Only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Offer him as a sacrifice on a mountain that I will tell you of. You know the song that says he left, speaking of this moment, he left his father's land and boyhood dreams were in the past. He held his son, God's promise. What more would his friend ask? Beyond the mountain, Abraham, take the fire, take the wood. So trusting still, they climbed the hill, knowing that what came would come for good. And when their altar was all finished and the wood was all in place, he looked with fear and trembling into his young son's face. God has asked this of me. There's no less that I can do. I have withheld nothing. I never dreamed he'd ask for you. And the wind blew softly. God leaned close and whispered low. If I'd ever wondered if you love me, now I know. It would have been easier for Abraham if God had said to him, go and offer yourself as a sacrifice. But God wants to know. See, you claim that you know the true and living God. You say you know the true God. You live around people who worship all kind of other gods. Well, they are willing to offer their children to their God. So if you know the true God, are you willing to do for the true God what they will do for their gods? When he was coming down with a knife, God said, now I know. Can God say that about us? Bang writer said, I had left the world behind me and my dreams were in the past but I kept a few choice treasures I kept a few choice treasures what more would my friend ask go to yonder mountain take the fire take the wood so trusting still I climbed the hill knowing that what came would come for good and when my altar was all finished and the wood was all in place I looked with fear and trembling into my own face God what are you asking there's no less that I will do, I'm yours for whatever. All I am, I give to you. 
Then the wind blew softly. God leaned close and whispered low, if I'd ever wondered if you love me. Now, I know. If we're not prepared to comply with this condition, he says emphatically, you cannot be my disciple. Oh, you can be a member of Pentecostal Tabernacle for sure, but not my disciple. Anybody here want to love Jesus best of all? I didn't ask you if you're loving him best of all. No, I'm just asking if you want to. And you and I might not be asked to sacrifice our son. We might just be asked to take a stand for what is right. Just in a day-to-day -day situation at work or at school. Doesn't have to be anything earth-shattering that the cleaner will report on. Just don't sell out Jesus anywhere. No matter where you are, serving in the boardroom, or if you're cleaning out the bathroom, make Jesus feel big. Yeah. Sell him out anyway. Let people know, that's my God. Second one, a willingness to take up the cross. Verse 27, Luke 14, verse 27. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Tough condition, folks. Tough condition. He didn't say you, you won't receive initial salvation. What he's saying is, you'll always stay as a believer. You'll never transition into being a disciple. The, we don't understand the expression because we, don't, we live 2,000 years removed from crucifixion. But Peter, Andrew, James, John, all of them that Jesus was speaking to here, they saw it almost every day, condemned men. Walking to the place of execution with a cross beam over their necks and over their shoulders. They, they saw that. And they knew that the cross meant only one thing, death. That's what the cross meant. When Jesus told them, if you don't take up your cross, he wasn't saying to them, no, we say, this is how we speak. I have a manager at work that is giving me trouble, but I just have to take up my cross and follow Jesus. You know, my children are giving me trouble at home, but, you know, it's part of my cross. My husband is not treating me good, but it's part... No! That's not part of the cross. That's cross is. Everybody has to deal with crosses. People who are not saved deal with crosses. God's people deal with crosses. You, it's, it's, you think it's only Christians have managers at work that give them a hard time? Everybody has people that give them a hard time. That's crosses. But, but, but if, see, this is how it works, folks. If, if your manager is at work giving you a hard time because of the name of Jesus, that's the cross. That's the cross. If they are treating you bad because you love Jesus. That's the cross. Jesus is saying, you better be willing to carry that. And he really doesn't care who it is, you know, folks. 
Remember John? John the Baptist? John the Baptist pointed Jesus out and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Take it away. Sin of the world. But now John is in prison. In trouble. And John is wandering. He's wandering. Did we make a mistake? Are you the same man, you know? Same one that he said, see him there? Now John is saying, are you the one that should come? Or look we for another? Why? Because John didn't expect that things would turn out like that for him. So Jesus just does some stuff. And maybe, maybe what John was questioning was not, see the Jews had a difficulty understanding that the suffering servant of Jehovah in Isaiah 53 was the same one who would be their Messiah. They thought it would be two different persons. So Jesus just does some miracles and he says, go and tell John what you see. Go and tell John what you see. Let, is it raining? It's raining? Yes, so, oh, okay. Nobody's going anywhere in a hurry. You know, I, I, I don't mean that. And, and, and so he says, you tell John what, what you see. And I, I guess, I just picture that as the messengers were going back. Jesus said, come here. Want you to tell John something else. Tell him, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Things not working out for you. Don't stop believing my, my ministry, John. You're locked up in prison. I'm still God. Don't be offended in me. Take up the cross. I didn't tell you things would work out the way you planned. My program is still going on. Just deal with it. Because you might never get what you think you would get. You might be sick and you might die. You might never get healing. But don't be offended in Jesus. Lift your hands and worship him. Apostolic church needs to understand that the meaning of the cross has not changed. It means death. And it means death to the selfish, self-centered way that is in all of us. A.W. Toza said this, the old cross is a symbol of death. It stands for the abrupt, violent end of a human being. The man in Roman times who took up his cross and started down the road had already said goodbye to his friends. He was not coming back. He was going out to have it ended. The cross made no compromise, modified nothing, spared nothing. It slew all of the man completely and for good. It did not try to keep on good terms with its victim. It struck cruel and hard. And when it had finished its work, the man was no more. Jesus wants to destroy the selfishness, the self-centeredness. The pride, the ego that prevents me from doing what he wants. And he's saying, deal with that. Deal with that. As I'm going to get it out of you one way or another. As long as you say you are my disciple. If we are unwilling 
to fulfill the condition of taking up our cross. He said categorically, you cannot be my disciple. And then finally, a surrender that is unreserved. Luke 14, 33. This is heavy. See, we, we just read it. I guess we just read it and just skip over it. It's a nice, nice tale. First of April, we're going to begin another Bible reading program, daily Bible reading program, concentrating on the four Gospels and, and trying, and, and, and our theme is, sir, we would see Jesus. We don't want, we want to see the Jesus of the Bible. He might be a little different than the Jesus that you believe you know. For instance, did you know that he had these requirements? So, verse Luke 14, 33. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Cannot. Without giving up everything. You cannot. He didn't say there's a chance. You cannot. What must I give up? Everything. Surrender that is unreserved. And we are here quibbling. I wonder if Jesus really meant what he said. All right. Try and not do it and find out. What was he asking for? Does he mean that I must go and sell all I have and give to the poor? No. What he means is, if I come to you and ask you to do it, you must be willing to do it. But don't go out and sell your car and say, Jesus, say you must sell your car. Or, 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 or don't give it away unless you're giving it to me. Remember that man that came to him and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So you ask a big question, but you want a little answer. You are asking about eternal life. And when the master says to you, one thing you lack, my God. I, you know what? I'm scared to ask some questions of Jesus because I don't think he will say to me, one thing you lack. He's going to say to me, John, a whole heap of thing you lack, you know. But this man heard one thing. Jesus said, if you would be perfect, tell all you have and give to the poor and then come and follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. Man's a treasure in heaven. Where is that now? How me going to spend that? Treasure in heaven. He was a rich man, the Bible says. He went away sorrowful. And Jesus didn't say, sir, that was a little rough, I must admit. Sell 50% of what you have and give to the poor. And you can still come and follow me. No, Jesus said, I'm not lowering the bar. One. I don't need you. One. The man went away sorrowful. He went away sorrowful. Why are you sorrowful? Don't you still have your money? But he knew. He knew. He knew that day he had sealed his fate. It's after this that Peter said, we have left all. What's in it for us? Jesus wants us to know that everything we say we have, we are just the custodians of it. You don't own it. You don't even own the clothes on your back. 
Because if you die tomorrow, just give a little time. Somebody else is going to wear it. I myself have worn dead people clothes. You know, we, we are so silly sometimes. I'm, I'm closing. You no, know, we, we, we talk about, we, we talk so strong. This is, this is mine. Yes. How it come to be yours? So if you die tomorrow, it's still yours. I, I, I think I really love my wife. And I told a group of people a couple of days ago, I said, we have been married for 32 years. 30, 30, 32 years. 32 years. And I told a group of people, we don't just love each other, you know, we are in love. Oh, folks, you know we're not playing, right? She got married to me on her 21st birthday. That's how you must do it. And it, she, we got married on the 16th of February. So it's close to Valentine's Day, so one present cover everything. I, 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 listen, I, I, I really believe I love her, you know, but, but, she's really not mine. Late Bishop Hoslin, I keep repeating this. He said, if you really want to know what is yours, just die. And then come back in one year's time. And you might be surprised who is wearing your clothes, driving your car, living in your house, sleeping in your, with your, Stand with me. <laughs> tell, tell somebody near you, the only thing you have that's yours is a relationship with Jesus. If you have it, if you have it. That's the only thing you have that's yours. So, 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 we're not massaging your emotions. We're telling you straight up what's required. Folks, you know that I'm asking myself some questions, right? I've been here since 1983, and I'm wondering, am I a disciple? Just being very honest with you, I know I'm the pastor, and I know I'm supposed to say yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself. I'm asking myself. A preeminent love. Do I have that? A willingness to take up the cross. Do I have that? An unreserved surrender. When I look at my money, do, do, when, when I get my salary, how things work out nowadays, you don't even get your salary. It go to the bank. But when you get your salary, do you say, how much of my money will I give to God 
or do I say how much of God's money will I keep for myself who is our God does he still demand the same things he did when this book came out think he has lowered the bar anybody here want to be a disciple here's the good news folks here's the good news here's the good news you don't have to be a disciple by yourself there's going to be a God that comes alongside you and you know I'm, I'm so happy for what God has been doing in my life I just tell people they say to me oh you know pastor I don't want to start serving God and stop I say you have it the wrong way man you see you see you think that is going to be you you don't understand there's going to be a power working in you giving you the desire and the power to live for him it's not up to you so the truth is none of us here really know what our discipleship is going to cost us none of us know none of us know if one day somebody won't put a gun to our heads and say if you don't recant your faith I'm going to put a bullet through your brain none of us know none of us know we don't know but and God doesn't need for us to know he just needs for us to say, I want to be a disciple. Because I know you're going to help me to lift that cross. I know you're going to help me to surrender. Disciples didn't understand everything. They just knew that Jesus was their only choice. You think the disciples understood everything? They were just as foolish as me and you. but they just had a love for God and Peter said we don't understand when you talk about eating your flesh and drinking your blood but he said who are we going to go to who are we going to go to we are going to stay with you until you make it plain we don't understand but we're not leaving you and one day if we stay with you long enough we'll understand everything your hands and worship you Where are the disciples? Where are those who want to be disciples? If, if, you, if you feel like God is... Well, you know, folks, it's a strange question. We, we should really be saying, if you feel like God wants you to be a disciple. Because once God calls you, that's what you are. If you feel like you want to be a disciple, lift your hand. Th those who are serious, he can deal with the cross. Come to the altar for a little. Those who want to be disciples. I'm going to pray for five minutes and go home. Disciple. Lord, I don't know what it really means, but I don't have an option. It's you are nothing at all. We have a song. If it's not you, then Lord, it's not you. Come beside me. Come beside me. Come beside me. Just for five minutes, we're closing.
what state you're in. He's not looking for perfect people. All of us are flawed. Everyone, doesn't matter how long you've been living for God, you've got major dysfunction.
Jesus be the Lord of all kingdoms of my heart. We just sing that and then we'll go. If you have to rush away, that's okay, we understand.
Take the 